In November 1975, an enormous marijuana crop, 375,000 cannabis plants, an estimated 60 tonnes of pot, was discovered growing at Colliambly, south of Griffith. In 1977, Donald McKay, the man who informed the police about this massive crop, disappeared. In my book, The Killer Cop and the Murder of Donald McKay, I question the conventional version of the McKay murder. Shows like Underbelly 2 present James Baisley as the murderer. Baisley is said to be the bargain baseman assassin who does the deed for $10,000. I believe James Baisley was framed. The man I nominate as the chief assassin is Fred Cray, the killer cop. Fred Cray was in Griffith at the time, working for Frank Newbin at the Newbin Hand Bank to suppress a scandal concerning secret accounts in the names of a local marijuana grower at the Newbin Packing Shed. It was a result of this scandal that Donald McKay was murdered. In Underbelly, a tale of two cities, the McKay murder is portrayed as the work of a lone assassin, James Baisley. Underbelly's version of the murder is wrong because it's based on a snitch's tale, a story invented to get indemnities for serious drug crimes. The way snitch provisions work is that if you can offer the police a bigger crime than the one you're accused of, you can bargain with them for indemnities. The snitch was Giafranchi Tizzoni. The Victorian police dubbed him the Songbird, the Supergrass. Tizzoni and his gang got off their major drug charges by saying they were part of a much bigger crime, the conspiracy to murder Donald McKay, and offering one gang member, James Baisley, as a murderer of McKay. Baisley had no alibi because he was a man on the run, having escaped from police custody. He was easy to frame. This snitch's tale is the source for the version of the murder in Underbelly, A Tale of Two Cities. Like Underbelly 2, Crime Investigation's documentary, The Donald McKay Disappearance, also shows the murder as the work of a lone assassin, because it too was based on Tizzoni's lies. After shooting McKay, Basley, the lone assassin, drags the body to the boot of his car, puts it in the boot and drives off. The problem with the lone assassin theory is that Donald McKay was a very big man, 95 kilograms and 188 centimetres tall. The lone assassin, James Basley, was slight, middle-aged and 168 centimetres tall. Ian Salmon was Don McKay's friend and solicitor and he discovered the murder scene about one o'clock the next morning. So I drove into the hotel yard. I saw immediately in the headlights of the car that this was Don's vehicle. I drove up to it and saw the shocking uh, evidence of, of, a, of a disaster. There was blood on the, in the area of the door and the front of the car. And if I recall it correctly, there was also some blood on the wall. Then looking further, I noticed these uh, cartridges on, on the ground. There were three. Uh, I would say there were 22 shells. Nor, as I recall it, were there drags and drag marks. If someone had dragged a heavy body, I would have thought some, some marks would have been left. I don't recall any drag marks. You'd have to be a very strong person to have lifted that him and, and handled him without making some marks. 
He was a big, strong, athletic man. Certainly, he was 15 stone. He would have been a very heavy, and uh, I curse the word, dead weight uh, for a living. Recreations of the murder give the impression the car park was empty. This was not so. It was a busy night. This was no bargain basement job. It was a big operation. There was a team of assassins. They were led by Fred Cray, a detective working for the Nugent Hand Bank. This was the best hit Frank Nugent's money could buy. Cray was in Griffith to hush up an affair involving secret accounts at the Nugent packing shed. Frank Nugent was using these secret accounts in his family's packing shed to wholesale an illegal vegetable. Truckloads of cannabis were leaving the Nugent packing shed and going to the markets in Sydney. Tony Reeves, the author of Mr Big and Mr Sin, is a leading Australian crime writer. While working for the ABC in the 1970s, Reeves met a truck driver who told him a remarkable story about the Nugent packing shed. I spoke with the truck driver. He did the regular run, carrying fruit and veggies from the Nugent warehouse in, um, in Griffith to the markets in Sydney at Flemington. And on a couple of occasions, a few occasions I think it was, he, at the Griffith end, he used to load his truck. At the Griffith end, he was given some money and said, go to the pub and have a couple of drinks. We'll load the truck tonight. And when he came back, the fully enclosed truck was locked with a new padlock and he drove to Sydney. And when he arrived at the Flemington markets, he was told the same thing. He was given $20, go over to the pub, we'll unload it today. And uh, when he came back from the pub, the truck had been emptied out. Uh, except for, on each occasion, he looked at it very carefully because he was very suspicious of what was going on. He found traces of marijuana leaves. He figured that if they loaded the truck up uh, fully, it would probably be about 10 tonnes of marijuana if they loaded it fully. That's a lot of grass was moving around. And going straight from the Egan warehouse to markets in Sydney. But, but of course, you couldn't... One of the difficulties I always had was who do you tell this story to? Do you go to the police, the, the friends of Freddie Cray, and say, now listen, we've got a problem here, you know? You just couldn't go to the police and report this sort of story, because you might end up dead. Through the scandal of the secret accounts, Donald McKay was about to find out about Frank Nugent's involvement in the drug trade.